So we've just finished our impacts. Um, I've done 18 impacts, three averages per point, and we've got six points across the blade surface. If we have a look at the software side, you can see that these points have gone uh, light green or teal coloured, which, which indicates that they are all optimal measurements. Okay? They could also be uh, acceptable if they were valid. If we've got yellow, then they could be overranged. Some of them, if I'd not measured them, would still be in blue. We want to avoid sort of anything that's not either optimal or green. Um, if we've got an overrange situation, it means we've either got too much response or too much excitation on the input signal, which means we need to go back in and change our A to D settings. You can see that it took us six minutes to do those measurements. If I'd gone and uh, done more points across the blade surface, it would have taken much longer. If I'd done more averages per point, it would have taken much longer. Here you can see on the left hand side here functions that we've captured. So this was the most recent um, frequency response function after three, uh, after three averages. And you can see those peaks, one, two, three peaks, and this transitions through uh, pi radians as we pass through a resonance or an anti-resonance. And that's nice, clean, reasonably clean looking data. Some of them that I got were better than that. It can be just a function of where you are on the blade. Sometimes they come out differently. The force measurements or the force uh, auto power spectra should always look the same. The response auto power spectra will look different depending upon where you've got the laser beam uh, uh, measuring on the blade. The response at each point is different. Okay, and therefore the frequency response function, which is one divided by the other, will be also different each time. If I can hit OK here, hopefully I can also show a coherence function. For the most recent measurement, I don't know whether it will show me, it might have averaged, but we should keep an eye on coherence. We also want to have coherence that's uh, close to 1 across the frequency range, which indicates we've got high signal-to-noise ratio on both channels. And there you see the coherence function. So there's a little bit of a dip in here, and that's because we've got an anti-resonance at this frequency. Um, if I change this one up here to also show, um, to show the FRF, in magnitude and phase, you'll see that that location that where I've got poor coherence will correspond to a frequency, actually that's 13.75 hertz, and that's somewhere in this region here. So I've got actually an anti-resonance in here. I'm looking on a different scale in these two windows, unfortunately. Um, if I go back to the FRF, you'll see that that's actually a very low level. So I've got low signal, there it is there right there, that's why I've got poor coherence because I've got an anti-resonance. So I've got low signal on the vibrometer measurement at that frequency. So we finished the measurement, it's saved the file. In, in, if we go to Windows Explorer, you'll see that this Marley Short was saved at 1.12 p.m. on the 3rd of, or 2nd of March, which is today. Um, and I can double click that from Windows Explorer. That will actually open for me the PSV for 9.4 PSV 9 um, presentation application. All right, so it looks the same or it looks similar in terms of the layout. Here are in the same way as before all of the, you know, the folder structure from before. This is my most recent, it's sorting them by date. This is my most recent uh, measurement. Right, so double click it, it opens it up. You can now see immediately in here some indication of the measured velocity. Now this is nothing more than the amount of velocity that was measured across the entire bandwidth. We've not actually yet done any modal analysis. Okay, so I will open a second window um, in here because actually, no, sorry, what I'm going to do Make pardon me, is just go to define the bandwidth. So in, when I choose to find bandwidth, it's actually going to open a second window and show me the frequency response function. Now at the moment it's not auto-scaled. If I auto-scale it, we'll see those peaks again from the FRF. This is a sum FRF across the, uh, for all of the six points across the structure. Um, and I also want to show it in dB. Um, we're really only interested in these first three here, so I could zoom in. On this one, um, as before, if I just sit here and ask you to hit delete for me on the keyboard, didn't work. Keyboard's lost the connection to the 
computer, there we go. Okay, right, there you go. So now the, these are the peaks, and I'm looking to populate this table up here in an interactive way. So I left click on here and I, s I drag a, a line across here. You can see this brownish looking point, it gets, that's identified the peak within that like window there. And here it tells me that is between 5 and 9.37, 5 hertz, and the peak has been found at 6.85 hertz, and the bandwidth of that, that band that I'm searching in is the difference between the upper and the lower frequencies there, 4.375. Right, so I do that for all of these resonances, and that's now identified these three frequencies where basically I've got those are my actual frequencies, first three, and they're probably first bending, second bending, and maybe the first torsional model. We'll find out when we do the processing and animate. So all I do now is click the cross in the top window, and the software is then going to do the processing. It tells me the band definition of change. Do I want to recalculate? Yes. It's now calculating. And rather than show me as before the entire bandwidth up here, it shows me the three frequencies where I process these measurements. Okay, so the first one, the lowest frequency, is this big peak. This is the, this is the first bending mode. If I select that in here, I can animate that shape and hopefully that should be typically characteristic of a fundamental first bending mode. And if I zoom in on that one, you can see that it is exactly that. It's like the first frequency, so it's clamped over here. Okay, we haven't measured points all across here, but you can imagine and it's obviously exaggerated significantly, but that's the fundamental frequency there, right, right there, the first cantilever bending mode. And then I can just scan through them. Okay, there's the second bending mode, I think, although the number of points I've got is relatively small. I've got like a nodal line across the blade here. Um, there's quite a lot of vibration up here, and this one is, the tip is out of phase with what's happening in the middle of the blade. So that's probably second bending although I just don't have enough points to be absolutely sure, but it looks pretty close to me. If I had more points, we'd see it in more detail. And then if I select this one, that's probably first torsion. You can see that there's twisting going on, and you know points on this lower side of the blade are out of phase with points on the upper side of the blade, and this will be clamped at the same, so that's like a torsional mode. Um, and I can then start to do things like save the animations, for example, as a WAV file or an AVI, sorry. Um, I can save just the upper view or the lower view. The lower view is not that interesting, it's going to be the same every time. But, but we might save both views so that we have as well as the uh, video. In that video it will show the, um, the, 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 the front f frequency response spectrum. So uh, there, are, there are some videos collected earlier. Conveniently, it's clever enough to tell me the frequency of the shape, so I don't have to type that in. Right? So if I save that one, it's going to now generate the AVI file. It tells me to use Media Player. Right? I can do the same thing for the second one. Unfortunately, it's one at a time. It doesn't, um, I think, allow us to uh, save them all at the same time. And you can see there now, being created in Windows Explorer. So if I go through Explorer here, um, probably sort by date, and then these two videos are at the top here. So double click them, and there you go. I've now got that in a format that I can include in PowerPoint presentation, for example. Um, I can take stills from it, you know, I can like, pause it, scan backwards, forwards to show the animation and so on. Okay. I can also open this SVD file in a, in a package called Scan Viewer, which is freely downloadable from Polytech, um, and is a Windows-based application. You can you probably have to create a Polytech profile, and they moderate that. But if you type the student.uts email address in, um, you'll be able, you'll be moderated, and they'll allow you to have a Polytech account, and you can download and install the Scan Viewer application. And that doesn't allow you to do the processing, but if you've already processed like we've just done here and saved that, you can see now it's got a star against it, it's not saved, make sure you save it. And then you can export that into, onto a USB drive, copy it across onto OneDrive or share it via email. There, there could be a bit on the large side for email, especially with lots and lots of points. Um, you can, uh, what is it? Oh, it's just over, it's a megabyte at the moment with six points. So the more points, the larger the file gets. At some point it might be too big for, um, for email, but you can send them to yourself or whatever. 
and you can view them as a scan viewer. You can't do more processing. You can just view what's already processed. Um, what else can we do? We can export also as, for example, an ASAM ODS file, and this is important if we want to open these data up in, for example, Siemens Sim Center desktop, and there is an installation of Siemens Sim Center or Test Lab, which is the application name on Workspace. So you can choose ASAM ODS, and that's an interchangeable file format for modal analysis, and um, this will allow you to open it up, and you can choose the functions that you want to export and the points. So it's going to export the point name, one, two, three, four, five, six, and the X, Y positions of those points. It will export the functions that are defined in here, so FFTs, um, all of those values, it will export you know, all of these functions via an ASM ODS and display ob objects, the elements, i.e. the things that we create with the lines um, and, and so on. And the bands that were defined actually in the Polytech software, so the processing that we did um, and the bands are defined up in here. So we might not necessarily want the bands, we might just want the functions from the points to import into um, Siemens and process those in Tesla. And that's it for the videos. I hope that's useful. Now you're all experts on PSV.